which I think is ideal. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I, I'm actually, you know, really interested to hear your talk. Um, Eliezer Ostreco from ANU, and he's going to talk about non-hermission topology and exciton polariton systems, inspirations from losses. Okay, uh, I hope it's showing the right screen. Yep, uh, good morning. Everybody. Yeah, it, it all looks good. Okay, right, thank you. Yep, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land that we meet. At least here in Canberra, we have the Nambri and Ganawal people and acknowledge the elders past, present, and emerging. And if there is, <clears throat> uh, I would like to extend that acknowledgement to um, regional and Torres Strait Islanders uh, with us, uh, listening with us today. Uh, yep, so um, you can call me Eli. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm now a RC Decker Fellow under uh, Ellen Ostrovskaya's group at ANU, and uh, I've been studying external polariton uh, systems for about I don't know for about uh, eight years now, and uh, this talk is uh, mostly on one uh, side of the um one particular topic that we are interested in which is uh, non-hermitian physics and lately with uh, non-hermitian uh, topology so <clears throat> i would like of course to acknowledge the, the team that have been working on so we start with this uh, uh we started like five of us and um, most of the works that we sent is this uh was led by Tinge Gao when he was our postdoc and I was a PhD student. And Leo was uh, also part of uh, this works as well, who is now, uh, Leo now is, uh, uh, is now in Monash University. <clears throat> and the other works are done in collaboration with Matthias Wardak, who has uh, given his uh, presentation fleet seminar two months ago. And Ting He Yun, who uh, was a um, uh, PhD student from Monash, but he was with us uh, for uh, most of the time, and now he's back in China. Maciek also gave a fleet seminar a uh, few years ago, and the Brufka visited us, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, during COVID, but we were very, very productive during her, uh, her visit. So <clears throat> we also um, acknowledge, uh, also acknowledge as collaborators. Uh, there's a lot of them. I can't list all of them, but uh, mostly our uh, PIs, Ben Hoefling from Woodsburg University, who has uh, provided us with uh, some of the samples that are presented here and also with uh, David Snow. And uh, the latter part of the, the talk, we have uh, our very close collaboration with Tim Liu <clears throat> and Professor Chi Shong, who is now moved uh, to Tsinghua University. And of course, Dr. Rui Su has uh, also visited us um, just before COVID to <clears throat> um, do this wonderful experiment. So <clears throat> my talk, be mainly about exciton polaritons. So they are uh, like matter particles that can form a quantum fluid at ambient conditions. So because of their properties that I will say, explain later on, you can form Bose-Einstein condensate in superfluids at room temperature. And because of this, uh, we have now this uh, a very good technological step towards application of these macroscopic quantum states. So. Uh, there are a number of um, uh, proposals for uh, solid state platform devices based on external polaritons like ultra low threshold lasers, all optical logic gates, maybe quantum simulators, and of course, at uh, sleep, we propose low energy devices. And this is a uh, part of a uh, research theme two, where we want to create a uh, a superfluid transistor that um, <clears throat> takes advantage of the zero resistance in a superfluid. So the other topic that I won't be really delving into because uh, um, most of us here in fleet is familiar with it is on topological physics. And I think the main interesting part for us is because of this topological protection, you get these robust effects. So for example, with uh, the quantum hall effect, um, <clears throat> we get this um, um, ladder uh, in the whole resistance. These ladders are apparently really robust against uh, fluctuations in temperature and impurities. And understanding this um, effect in language of topology has, uh, has done the 
advent of you know topological materials and, and this is one of the it's the main um, <clears throat> subject of interest in fleet and we can we are hoping to create this topological insulator transistor so <clears throat> this topological physics is is, uh, is sort of i would say universal because uh, you can there's now some imitations because i mean it's a it's a general thing and it's been a lot of advances in photonics and topological photonics and ultra cold atoms even in synthetic dimensions and electrical circuits, uh, to name a few. So the other uh, topic that I will be mostly talking about is uh, about non-hermitian physics, which is the physics of gain and loss. It has gained traction in the past 10 or 20 years. And it's because uh, of its, um, partly because of the some counterintuitive effects that uh, it brings to the tables. For example, um, when when we introduce loss to a material material, we know that a transmission will go down significantly. But if you design this loss properly uh, in a smart way, then as you increase the loss further, the transmission actually goes up, which is indeed counterintuitive. And this has uh, been shown for lasers as well. So when you increase the loss in laser, then you you sort of turn off the laser. But apparently some particular design, as you increase the loss further, the lacing will turn on again. So indeed, this is a counterintuitive effect and it might be useful for a lot of applications. So this field has, has blown up and there's a lot of uh, other effects as well, like unidirectional reflectance and invisibility, non-reciprocal light propagation and enhanced sensing in topological switching. So from here, you can already see that there are some topological effects in non-permission physics. And this is what uh, I've been, <clears throat> I will um, um, present in this work. And I give you a question that maybe we, we can create some low energy device out, out of these losses. So in the in the in this superfluids and topological insulator, we sort of choose a system that has uh, no resistance. But maybe uh, adding resistance to it can uh, and I mean, uh, properly designing the, the resistance or at least the loss, then we can create a new device. But of course, uh, hopefully you'll get inspiration from this talk. So I have a basic outline here. We have, uh, I will, my talk, there's basically three parts the non emission effects in parameter space of excellent polaritons and emission topology of anisotropic excellent polaritons. And the last part is dissipative coupling and negative mass dynamics. I hope I have enough time to talk about the last part. So first, <clears throat> uh, let me introduce this like a refresher on exciton polaritons. So excellent polaritons are mixed states of light and matter. So how do we mix this? So you can think of it as, um, <clears throat> mixing them but not in like in a chemistry way in the physics way which is uh, interesting so we start with our first ingredient which is light so we choose a particular one which are called massive photons so when you place <clears throat> and these these photons exist in a planar microcavity so the planar microcavity is basically made of two mirrors parallel to each other and you want the distance between them to be in the order of the wavelength of light and then with that, when you look at the dispersion or at least the momentum or a wave vector depend uh, uh, the energy dependence of the wave vector and momentum, you can see that at k equal to zero, this is the in-plane momentum, the momentum around the plane of the mirror, you see that the energy is actually not zero. And because of that, you'll get this effective mass uh, near zero momentum. And um, it's not zero because you, you still have a uh, light bouncing back and forth, but at zero angle. <clears throat> so th this uh, creates our massive photons in a planar microcavity. So the second ingredient is the matter, which is exciton. So as you know, in, in fleet, uh, we study also uh, different types of excitons and <clears throat> these excitons, some of them can strongly interact with lights. And this is our uh, main ingredient. And you know, uh, if uh, basically we just fuse them and combine them, and this, <clears throat> once they are uh, combined, it forms a polariton. So let me, um, that's a polariton. 
show this simple uh, uh, structure. So you start with an exciton. When the exciton decays, it emits a photon, but this photon is trapped within the cavity. So the, there will be a continuous exchange of energy between the photon and the exciton. And when this exchange of energy is faster than other, uh, other you know, um, lost rates in the system, we create this new particle, new quasi-particle, which is the polariton. So basically, you, when they are mixed, yeah, you create this new quantum state. <clears throat> and he has these uh, um, properties. So they are composite bosons, therefore they can form a BC and they have some pseudo spin and this BC is a spin uh, condensate. So it, uh, the polariton inherits from the matter part, the strong Coulomb uh, interaction. So it gives it some uh, strong nonlinearity and gives some energy relaxation or scattering with each other. And of course, it's uh, important to create a superfluid. Uh, from the light part, it um, inherits very small effective mass, about 10 to the minus four of the bare electron mass. So this will enable high uh, critical temperature, which is uh, can go up to even uh, larger than room temperature, and also some <clears throat> ultra fast uh, dynamics in the order of picoseconds or yeah, tens of picoseconds. But uh, it also inherits the very short lifetime of the photon. So if you look at the mirrors here, the photons will, will be bouncing back and forth from the mirror, but the mirrors are not perfect. So eventually the photons will escape the cavity and this lifetime is of this order. And because of this uh, very short lifetime, it's, it's in the order of the scattering, uh, the energy relaxation of the system, then it prevents full thermalization of exciton polariton condensates, for example. This is uh, before it was uh, seen as a pro as problematic, but uh, as I will show you here, it's actually um, a feature and a very important feature, especially for understanding and non emission physics. <clears throat> so, how do we create polaritons uh, in the lab? So, this is like a very good uh, picture of how we make the sample. So. Instead of using metal mirrors, we use Bragg mirrors. So they're basically made of dielectrics, a layer dielectrics, just probably two types of dielectrics with different index of refraction. And you, when you, when the thickness is around, uh, when the thickness of each layer is around quarter of the wavelength of light, then you create a very good mirror with very high uh, reflectivity. <clears throat> and then you have these two mirrors and you place the exciton hosting material in between. And you can have this strong coupling with between the cavity photon and the exciton. And um, as I said, even if this mirror have very high reflectivity, the photons are very hard to, to trap and they will eventually leak out of the cavity. But <clears throat> this leak is actually really good because this photon carries a lot of information about the polariton. So the angle of emission is actually our in-plane momentum. So we, we, we image, uh, we'd be able to measure the momentum, for example. So the typical experimental setup is like this. We place the sample in a cryostat, depending on the sample, and <clears throat> some of them can work at room temperature. And we basically have um, uh, excitation. We, have, we use a laser, and we, we vary the shape of the laser, the spatial profile, and image it on the sample. So we have a spatially, um, we have a pump, uh, laser pumps, which have different shapes. And then the sample, it will create the polaritons inside and there will be some emission because of the, when the polariton decay and this will be collected towards our detection. So our detection is, uh, we have a lot of plethora, uh, we have a lot of imaging capabilities for polaritons. So we can measure in energy, um, time, real and momentum space. We can also measure the spin texture, and uh, we can also measure the phase of the condensate. So it's actually a very good system for studying microscopic quantum state. So it gives us this uh, really nice imaging techniques. And it's basically just uh, looks like watching a movie of, uh, of the condensate. So <clears throat> to create the condensate, uh, it's a complicated process. So I'll try to explain it uh, 
as good as possible as I can. So let's start with this uh, energy and momentum, uh, which, we, which we call as dispersion relation of the of the particles. So the exciton we basically approximate it as a as a constant um, dependence of momentum, the band structure, because uh, in this momentum range, it's basically a constant because of its really big effective mass. And the photon you have here is quadratic because um, <clears throat> they are quadratic near the zero uh, in plane momentum uh, angle. Now, when you have coupling between them, you form that exciton polariton. So there's an upper branch and the lower branch. So and you can clearly see this level of repulsion, which defines your uh, strong interaction between photons and excitons. <clears throat> now to create them, we first pump using our laser, very high energy. We, we, we basically pump particles into the system above the band gap. So this creates this high energy um, particles, maybe electron hole plasma, which quickly decays into the exciton. So here you can see the curvature of exciton because I assume this is very high K. And this very hot exciton will further cool down to lower momentum or lower energy by, for example, phonon uh, emission. And they will get to a point wherein there's a very uh, drastic change in curvature or density of state that they get stuck here. And this is uh, what we call the exciton reservoir. And further scattering towards the ground state where, where the BC can form is, uh, is inefficient. And, um, <clears throat> but there will be some scattering. And eventually when you have uh, <clears throat> occupation of one in the ground state, for example, then you have st uh, stimulated scattering towards the ground state. So another way of simplifying this uh, picture is like this. So we create the reservoir. So basically the pump creates the reservoir. It's almost have the same shape as the reservoir. This reservoir of excitons has some decay rate, which is in the order of nanosecond for double mass nine. <clears throat> and this reservoir pumps particles into the condensate at some rate, which we call RNR. And this condensate also have some decay um, because of the finite lifetime of polaritons also decay at some, the different uh, about, about this lifetime. <clears throat> and also, another important thing that's not in the picture is that the reservoir actually pushes the condensate. That's why you get this additional um, energy. This is because the reservoir is highly exotonic and there's a, a repulsive interaction with the polaritons in the condensate. So an even simpler picture is just with this equation that, we, that the reservoir creates complex potential. So the reservoir is created by the laser. So <clears throat> we have this, the, the, the real term is uh, this uh, pushing or repulsive attraction in the reservoir. And you have this imaginary term, which comes from the feeding of the reservoir to the condensate and the minus term, which is the decay of the condensate. So um, this is of course an approximation, but it works really well for a system. <clears throat> So, and because you have NR here, which is directly, uh, the shape has direct, uh, has almost the same form as your pump, then we can create different um, potentials. So for example, I, um, before there's this uh, sim um, simple experiment, we here have two pump spots. So basically, uh, and the, the one below the red is, uh, you think is the um, potential, the underlying potential created by the two pump spots. <clears throat> and then you can see there's a saddle here and you can create this uh, condensate, which is highly non-equilibrium as you can see. The condensate, the flariton condensate forms in basically all, almost all of the uh, levels in the system. And this is why I said that the non-equilibrium part of the system is inter actually interesting because it allows us to occupy this uh, highly excited states. Of course, this is not a trap, and it, it's just a, it's a, it's amazing because here, when you create the condensate, the condensate decay, but it's also being constantly being fed by the pumps here of the reservoir. Now, if you uh, make the, if you close the trap, for example, here where you have a, we have a ring, then you create a, you create an actual trap for the condensate, and so it's. Um, it's schematically shown here. So 
the pump is uh, will be like a ring and it provides particles that flows everywhere. But because it also is a trap, then some of them will be trapped inside and form a trapped condensate. So <clears throat> for the first part of this talk, uh, um, we, we show that uh, we went beyond this uh, circular trap and designed different shapes for the potential. So simple example is a square billiard, or basically a square trap. <clears throat> and from this spectrum, you can see that we were able to occupy four states. And we can clearly, um, using tomography, we can identify the spatial profile of these uh, uh, four distinct states. <clears throat> so uh, since the this uh, spatial profile is made with laser, then we can easily change the shape with different uh, beam shaping optics. <clears throat> And so what we did is to deform the square billiard. So initially it is square and then one corner, we basically you know, deform it around the equilibrium point. And this is what we've seen. So if we deform um, um, <clears throat> the X and the Y, we, we get this. Uh, and then we look at the dipole modes, not the ground state, just the dipole modes. And we get this, uh, what, you, what we typically call as the level dynamics, as you can see, <clears throat> they sort of uh, intersect around the uh, equilibrium position, which is expected. And if we, based on our simulations, if you look closer here, it actually looks, it's a tilted uh, um, diabolical point, because this is in parameter space. And if you plot it nicely here, you can clearly see this uh, <clears throat> uh, diabolical point. And you know, this diabolical point, you can simply represent with a two-way to uh, Hamiltonian. So what we are now that we have a diabolical point, one of the interesting things to do is to go around a diabolical point. So this is similar to, uh, I think, an electron going around a magnetic field. <clears throat> so uh, we, because we can also image the profile. So for example, we start uh, it's shown here, and these are deformation parameters. We start with one point, for example, let's say somewhere here, <clears throat> and then we. We, we change the parameters and image the, the spatial profile, and then we set a face to it, for example, like this face configuration, then slowly follow the profile and uh, assuring that uh, the face smoothly evolves as well. And as you can see, after one rotation, we do go back to the same mode, but there is a face difference. <clears throat> and therefore you need to, do another loop to go back to the original state. So we have shown this for one dipole and we have also shown this for the other dipole. And this is uh, exactly the, it's like a motion around um, following a Mobius strip. And this is uh, what, uh, this is exactly our logo. <clears throat> so it's nice that with this uh, system, you can deform uh, the billiard to explore this kind of physics. So, but in this particular one, we're mostly, only looking at the real part and basically neglected the imaginary part as it's the same as the previous measurements I've shown. So what if we include the imaginary part? So <clears throat> I introduce some non hermitian concepts here first. So uh, we look at the level dynamic. Let's start with this two by two permission system. If you, you're, um, you know, it's a very common one. When you calculate the energies and you have this off diagonal term, and if it's not zero, if it is zero, then you just basically have this crossing. But if it is not zero, then you have this uh, interaction between the levels and you, you basically create this level repulsion. So we call this uh, anti-crossing here. <clears throat> now, what if our energies have an imaginary part because you know they are unstable, uh, they have some finite lifetime or is proportional to the line width? Then you, you solve for eigenvalues and you have this additional term. The delta gamma here is your, it's a difference in the imaginary parts. Yep. <clears throat> so when your uh, coupling strength is stronger than this delta gamma, you sort of see the same behavior as what you have seen here. So there is an anti-crossing, <clears throat> but there's actually a new effect. Uh, when you look at the imaginary part, the imaginary parts actually cross. So uh, it's, uh, 
Um, we all, when it's a narrow emission system, we look at the imaginary part as well. Now, if the um, coupling, this is V, is weaker than the difference in the imaginary part, then you actually have a crossing. And in this crossing, uh, crossing in energy, and when you look at the line width, the line width sort of anti-cross. So <clears throat> you would imagine that as V is tuned or delta gamma is tuned, there will become a point wherein this anti-crossing becomes a crossing and yeah, and vice versa. So there is indeed a transition point, which is what we call an exceptional point. At this point, at this parameter, um, two V equals to gamma, um, delta gamma, we get both crossing in the real and in the imaginary part. <clears throat> and that is because the, the eigenvalues form this up, uh, um, has this uh, behavior in the parameter space of their energies in this uh, Riemann sheets. So as you can see, when delta gamma is large, which is this case, we have crossing here in the real part, then anti-crossing the imaginary part. And then when delta gamma is small, then we get this uh, behavior shown here on the left. <clears throat> but as you can see, there is a point here that basically connects the branch it's a branch point uh, um, <clears throat> basically connect, connects these two regimes. And re already you can see that there's some interesting topology in this uh, energy uh, Riemann sheets. So now going back to the experiment, <clears throat> we now um, use a billiard, but we, we now take advantage of this uh, imaginary part. So instead of using a simple square billiard, we use a sinai billiard. So it's basically a rectangle with a circular defect with radius r, and then we have a thickness of the walls of the billiard or thickness g. So we use this specifically because this is, in the classical limit, this is uh, chaotic. That means the energy levels will uh, try to avoid each other. So there will be a, um, a lot of uh, energy anti-crossings in the emission and in the emission limits of the system. <clears throat> so this is indeed what we have observed. So we look at, of course, when we do this measurement, we see a lot of different states. As you can actually see the gray one is a very high order mode, but we only focus on these two uh, modes. So it is a, actually a dipole and like a three lobe mode. <clears throat> and as you can see there, they have some anti-crossing. This anti-crossing is core shown because on the left side, it looks like a dipole, but on the right side, Become this three load mode. So there is some anti crossing in energy. And you can also look at the line width that uh, there is a crossing in the line width. So we now want to tune this such that we can convert this anti crossing to a crossing. Like the same uh, with this uh, parameter here, we change the defect size. And we found out that it's uh, to change this from anti crossing to crossing, we need to change this thickness d. What happens when we change the wall thickness, it controls the overlap of the eigenstate with the reservoir. And as a, as a result, this dipole and this free load mode will have different uh, overlap with the reservoir. So it, you will basically change the, any, the uh, difference in their line widths. <clears throat> and this is indeed what we have observed. So we converted the crossing to anti, uh, the anti crossing to a crossing. And then we look at the line width, we, we see an anti crossing. <clears throat> So therefore we have a signature here of an exceptional point. And of course, finding the exceptional point is impossible because it's a single point, but uh, similar to the diabolical point, um, we get some interesting effects when we encircle this um, exceptional point. <clears throat> so it's a very similar procedure as uh, for the one before. So we suspect the exceptional point is somewhere in our parameter space, and then we basically True in our parameter space by increasing R and changing D to go around it. So, <clears throat> so you can see here, and then same procedure, we image the the, uh, the mode profile, then we and we set a phase and then make sure that we evolve around it. We that the phase evolves smoothly as well. But for this particular one, we needed to do some simulations as well because uh, it's a very <clears throat> um, that it's not trivial to see where how the phase would evolve. So after one loop, what happens is uh, in this system we actually don't go back to the original mode. We move. We end up to, to the other state, which is a three lobe mode. When you start with a um, dipole, <clears throat> so we need to continue with our loop. So from 
from the three lobe mode here for one loop, then we go back to the two lobe mode where we start. So these are this these are already two loops. But as you can see, the start and the end has again this uh, phase uh, difference. So this would mean we, we need to do another set of two loops to go back to original state. <clears throat> and this is because uh, of the non-trivial topology of the um, band structure or the energy. So as you can see, if you start from here, from one of the energy uh, sheets, as you go around it, you actually end up in the other uh, energy uh, sheet. So you need to do another one to go back to the first. And as you can see, after you go back to the original energy sheet, you get this pi phase, so similar to the diabolical point. So therefore you need to do this four times. <clears throat> and unfortunately I can't find uh, a picture on how this would look like. It's like a double um, Mobius strip. And yeah, maybe it's like an inspiration for Flip 2.0. <laughs> so <clears throat> yes, so, so now you have uh, shown that uh, uh, the, the energy structure close to the exceptional point has this uh, interesting topology. <clears throat> and now um, how about the actual eigenstate? So we only look at that energy. So at the exceptional point, the Hamiltonian would look like this. And of course there is a degenerate energy eigenvalue because there's only one uh, eigenvalue. But the other interesting part with this non-Hermitian system is there will also be a single eigenvector. So in Hermitian systems, the energy can be degenerate, but you still have two independent eigenvectors, but in, in the exceptional point, you actually only have one. And there you have a particular configuration, which has this pi over two uh, phase between the two original holes. <clears throat> and this is very, uh, this is um, not uh, at exactly at the exceptional point this appears, but close to it, it actually just increases in value. So this is also observable, even if you're not exactly at the exceptional point. So, dem so, dem so to demonstrate this experimentally, we use a ring and in this ring, we, all, we sort of uh, cut in half so that one side of the ring has more reservoir and it's very thin on the other side. This way, if you look at here, this dipole mode will have a stronger overlap with the reservoir. So therefore we can tune, we can strongly change this, uh, the gain on it compared to the other one. So we can, similar to the other uh, experiment that we sent before. And then we have a simulation here from Leo on <clears throat> uh, by uh, these two where you can get this crossing and anti-crossing behavior as before. <clears throat> and indeed, close to the exceptional point, we should be somewhere here. When you look at the, uh, this is, uh, these are the two images away from the exceptional point, so somewhere here. You have these two dipoles, but if you add them up, in this manner, then you can you create a vortex. So if in in normal system this phase uh, this is emission, then the phase is it's hard to say what phase the 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 interference between them will pick. But here there's no actual interference. There is a chiral a single chiral state, and it always forms a vortex as uh, shown here. So here we have also shown that at the exceptional point there is a, a chirality. So, so far we have shown that exon collide and condensates are excellent platform for studying non-Hermitian physics. We confirm exceptional points, the topological very phase, the unique non-Hermitian degeneracy, and the number of loops you need to take around uh, the exceptional points to go back to the original state. So in terms of the eigenvectors, <clears throat> we only have actually one eigenvector at the exceptional point, and it is chiral, and it only, this chirality is sort of, uh, Smooth, uh, goes down and you move away to the exceptional point, but it is there and it allows us to generate text um, condensates. So these experiments are done in parameter space. So it would be nice to do this uh, to explore this non emission effects in momentum space because they directly affect the Polarton dynamics and they can probably lead to richer topology. <clears throat> so to move forward, we uh, give a uh, view on the dispersion of um, polariton. So let us focus on the lower polariton because that's the only thing we've been working on anyway. <clears throat> so at the lower polariton, we can um, approximate the dispersion using this Hamiltonian. 
But as you can see now, this is two by two because there are uh, the Polariton system has two spins. Uh, it's like a spin one half, but it is uh, uh, a boson. But, but these two spins basically just the circular polarization of light that interacts with the exciton. <clears throat> So we can uh, model the dispersion here using this uh, simple model. So we have diagonal components, which is basically some average, um, you know, the average um, dispersion of the system. So it looks like this one. So it's parabolic. It's like a, you know, a massive particle. <clears throat> then you do have this off diagonal components. So the first one, the blue one, is called. Uh, we call it the TTM splitting. So it's like a spin orbit coupling. Um, but so this originates because the mirrors, as you know uh, from optics, that the mirrors for will ref, uh, at different uh, when you at some angle the mirror will uh, reflect different uh, intensities for T and TM modes. I, I mean that is how we use our sunnies for, <clears throat> and the alpha here is the red one is called uh, X Y splitting. So what it does it lifts the degeneracy at k equal to zero. So now you have two states k equal to zero. <clears throat> and it leads to this anisotropic dispersion such that, for example, in the kx direction, you don't have a crossing. The two modes are actually separate. But in the ky direction, you have this uh, crossing at some particular k. So this has been observed in a wide range of uh, systems. It's just a matter of, uh, I think it's just a matter of if you can resolve this splitting uh, really well. <clears throat> So another way of looking at this Hamiltonian is in the language of like uh, gauge fields. So basically, we have this particle and plus a gauge field, and it looks like this. We have a gauge field along x, along y, and zero along uh, z. And <clears throat> from here, the the dispersion that we have shown before that only cross along y is a uh, this is a uh, flip. <clears throat> but they actually form a uh, tilted Dirac cones. So I, I removed the mean so that it looks like an upright Dirac cone and just you know, highlighted the Dirac cone here. So basically we have two Dirac cones in momentum space. <clears throat> one interesting uh, fact about this one is uh, uh, in the language of, uh, of an effective gauge field, we, we basically look at the uh, spin uh, the polarization of the photon, for example. So in the Poincaré sphere, we map it to a block sphere, and then here is the circular polarization of the photon, and you have the linear polarization configuration along the equator. When you do this, then you can calculate the pseudo spin uh, texture or the field texture in the system, and you can actually see there's like uh, two monopoles at both ends emanating from the Dirac point. So one one is like um, you have outward flow of the field and one is the sink. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when you add a sigma z term here or a, you know out of plane field, which is done experimentally um, before, and you will open the gap very similar way to how we do it in solid state systems. <clears throat> and because of this, we can create this finite very curvature as shown by uh, our colleague Olivier. And from this final curvature, you can observe this anomalous hole drift, which is very small, but still uh, observable. Now, this if to get this uh, uh, this topological effect, we, we need this very strong magnetic field in my Tesla. But now, uh, if you add loss to the system, you can sort of also observe a new type of uh, topology. <clears throat> so we found out that because non emission uh, um, because polaritons have, have losses, then the then the, the gauge field must be complex as well. And it turns out that it's simply these two parameters, beta and alpha, just simply extend them into the complex space. And it actually, based on our simulation, actually fits the experiment really well. So for this, we we, <clears throat> we use a perovs, lead halide perovskite in a micro cavity. And then we measure the, the real, uh, the energy, which is the real part, and also the line width. As you can see, along this direction, we have crossing in energy. And then we look at the line width. There is also a crossing in line width, but this crossing happens at a different case or around here. <clears throat> so uh, 
And what happens actually to the Dirac points that I have shown before, they will split into a pair of exceptional points shown here. So instead of opening up when you add a um, magnetic field, here when you add loss, you actually convert the Dirac point to a pair of exceptional points. So <clears throat> what is interesting is this is a, has a simple, very simple structure. You create these two exceptional points, they're actually connected to each other. So this is the, the, the connection. The green one here is when the energies are degenerate. And this is called the Bach Fermi arc, which they uh, <clears throat> just uh, what you see in also in 3D uh, biosystems. And there's also a connection with the imaginary one, which we call the imaginary Fermi arc. So they form loops, closed loops in momentum space. So all of these exceptional points are connected to each other. So it's kind of either be two loops, two separate loops, or a big uh, single loops, or the loops can, um, the lines, the arcs can extend to infinity as well. <clears throat> so now to find the exceptional point in the system, we sort of use this guide that we know where the Fermi arcs are. So for example, if we know that the exceptional point is somewhere here, then we cut, we look at the energies along this direction in momentum space, and this is how it will look like. So in energy, they almost kiss each other, but in line with definitely there is a crossing. <clears throat> then as we move to the left, now we cross the imaginary arc, Fermi arc, and then we can clearly see this crossing in imaginary arc and anti-crossing in the real part. So <clears throat> from here, doing this like basically a scan, we can sort of uh, estimate where the exceptional points would be. So and indeed confirm their existence. So here we have this scan and you can really see here, these are the, where we think the exceptional points will be. And we measure a Fermi arc around 0 0.31 inverse Michael. This is very small. <clears throat> and this has also been observed in a photonic crystals as well, this observation of the bulk Fermi arc in this two-dimensional system. <clears throat> now, uh, before we've shown that in the, there's a chirality at like exceptional points. So how does it look like here? <clears throat> so this is now our gauge field and we have these exceptional points. Now, when we actually uh, look at the polarization around this exceptional point, it actually look like this. So in this system, there is no sigma Z term, but we actually have circular polarization. And this circular polarization is our uh, chirality. And another important thing uh, just a reminder here, to get circular polarization, the emission limit, you need to add this uh, magnetic field, uh, this sigma uh, out of plane magnetic field. <clears throat> now, there's another important thing here is you can stay state one and state two actually have the same circular polarization. We would assume that the two states will be orthogonal with each other, but uh, it is not the case here. And, you, um, and this is how I picture it in... Uh, in uh, the block sphere or in the Poincaré sphere. So when you are away from the exceptional point, you have this uh, antipodal uh, Stokes spectra, which basically they are, means that they are orthogonal <clears throat> um, states. Now, as you get closer and closer to the exceptional point, they remain uh, 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 antipodal in the, in the equator, but they actually tend to point towards the same pole. <clears throat> And this is uh, where it starts to break the non-orthogonality. And as you can see, at the exceptional point, these two vectors will combine the single eigenvector at the exceptional point, and you see that it's uh, pointing directly to the uh, north pole. So this is the uh, <clears throat> effect of non-orthogonality. And this indeed, uh, this uh, the theory configuration, and these are what we have measured in the experiment because they have the same thing. So actually, uh, the same circular operation is actually very easy to measure in the experiment. <clears throat> so, and this also been observed in a, a purely photonic system. So the, the second thing is the topology of the eigenstate. So the, it's robust of M. Um, um, so we have look at the topology of the uh, energy eigenvalues. So now we look at the uh, eigenstate. So this is the polarization half charge around exceptional points. This is basically the pseudospin vector and we look at how it evolves around the exceptional point and you get a polarization half charge and this has been observed in uh, um, before in a photonic system this is the and then when <clears throat> you add a sigma set perturbation which which can open a gap 
what happens is that the two pair of exception points will approach each other, but not decay first. But if you look at the eigenvectors, you still see that the this half uh, this charge this half charge becomes a full charge, an integer charge, and they stay at the same position in momentum space, as you can see here also for the other mode. Then eventually, when the gap fully opens, the exceptional points, the pink dots here, will disappear, and you still have this uh, uh, charge in the eigenvector. Uh, it will remain there where they are. <clears throat> so the half charge, the original half charge here, is not stable against sigma and perturbation as it becomes a full charge. However, <clears throat> we um, there's a new theory on how we define a non-emission topological invariant, and it has the same half charge around the exceptional point, but it's defined in the complex energy eigenvalues, not in the eigen eigenstate, which is new to the system. <clears throat> and we were able to directly measure this because we are able to measure the energy and line widths, and we, we did in see, uh, see this uh, half charge. And this half charge, of course, is uh, stable against the perturbation around uh, the outer plane direction, as you can see here, unlike the half polarization winding, which is not uh, stable. So I think I will end uh, my talk here. So, so far we have demonstrated that exceptional points in momentum space, realized a non-hermitian gauge field, differentiate topologies between eigenstates, sorry, it's uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors and directly measure the novel topological environment. This is a non-emission topology, it's a very active research field, and it's still, we have, of course, a lot of questions about this uh, uh, system. And I will end it there. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, okay, I, I um, oh yes, I saw, uh, some reaction. I guess I had a question, sort of a sort of large scale question, which is, does do you did do something special with materials? I mean, you talked about like this incredible phenomenology that you observe, but mm -hmm. it, you know, do you have to do something special, or will any exciton thing you put it in a you know put yeah. it in a cavity and it'll it'll do this? Yeah. So, uh, do you think for the non hermitian physics or the like condensation? I think you can pick whatever you want to answer there. I mean, I, you know, because yeah. I really, okay. you know, yeah. sort of interested so, overall, like how general the phenomena are. Yeah. So for exciton polaritons, uh, it's a veg uh, it's a general effect. So you can even use other uh, solid state excitations like phonon to couple with light. And it just appears that exciton polaritons is uh, more interesting because I think historically uh, people want to condense excitons. And then so coupling excitons to photons have been a uh, warm, like a uh, more straightforward direction. And that uh, has been productive in creating uh, convincingly this uh, both unsigned condensates at elevated temperatures. In terms of non-hermitian physics, it's, uh, I think for now, there's not, no engineering that we did in our system. It's just that we, we, we characterize the system and if you, if you don't neglect the imaginary part, then you get you're able to explore this new physics. So, yeah. So I, I hope those uh, uh, that answer both questions. Uh, I think that yeah, but then I guess the next question is that the you know one of the one of the real attractions is this you know doing things at room temperature, you know, getting yeah. sort of exotic quantum physics at room temperature, and so. Um, what what controls that and you know what are the you know how high can you go yeah, so so in terms of effective mass it, it's more than room temperature so it's not the mass uh it's a problem so it's a problem is the uh, stability of the excitons so for gallium arsenide which is the first part of our sample the excitons won't exist at room temperature because the binding energies are really small uh, not really small but they're small like 10 mev so it's less than the thermal uh you know, thermal energy. So there, thermal energy, yeah. 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 But others, other materials. So I think there is a push now in the field to, to find materials that are, have stable excitons. There's a number of them. But the second is to actually make sure that that material itself is stable. So perovskites are very, pretty good. They condense room temperature, but you know they don't last as long. I mean, our gallium arsenide samples, we've been using it for five years or more. And they, 
they're still working, but yeah. oh, I see. <laughs> oh, so so the, the perovskites, it's like the air sensitivity that's the issue. Yeah, yeah, Is that right. Yeah, okay. yeah. So okay. I think even yeah. So yes. So uh, there are also the organics uh, which works well at room temperature, but the organics are also not stable uh, against bleaching of the laser. When you use the laser, they eventually oh. die. Yeah, so yeah. I think for now there's no perfect material yet. Okay. So it's mostly on the material side. I yeah, well that's why I, was, I mean I, I'm so sure. So, so the point is if you have like a really so you want a really high binding energy, yeah, but do you pay the point. dipole, do you pay the dipole coupling or that's uh, yeah. fine? so it's uh, it would be also good to have the dipole uh the coupling strength to reduce uh, to to create a rabbit coupling that is you know to to be more than the line width so you can see actually two levels so yeah uh, for for example for tmds uh, this is just above the line width of tmds we have shown this but condensation tmds uh, um, it, it seems to be very hard so gallium i think the interesting one would be wait, gallium, wait, wait. Right? so what makes it hard i mean i'm just trying no. to get a sense of like yeah. what the challenges yeah, so are the, and, the you question know. now with i think the problem with uh, excitons in tmds is because the excitons there have very short lifetime Oh, it's a second. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So th that's also the problem. <laughs> it seems stable and relatively stable and have binding, a large binding energies, but yes, the lifetime. Okay. So and then, but that's a real materials problem. Got it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, the, yeah, probably eventually we, we'll be able to create really nice TMDs. Then I probably it will, it will work. Got it. Okay. Um, no, thanks. That was great because, you know, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess the, and, and also with the gauge physics, is the temperature also like, a, are there sort of uh, considerations like that, that sort of, yeah. you know? So at least the one that I'm studying here, there are this, the gauge is coming from the photon part. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I would say that it's not really dependent on temperature. It depends on the photonic material, like the, the cavity, if they are, if their refractive indices will change strongly with the, with the, the temperature. But yeah, it would be also interesting to find the effective gauge field from the material itself, not the photonic part from the matter. Oh, I see. So for, like for TMDs, you have this uh, value physics. I think that would be interesting, but but for now, it's very hard to decouple the two values. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Sorry to monopolize, but I had a burning question. Um, Okay, no, but that was that was beautiful. Thank you so much. You. And um, let's let's all thank Eli. And uh, thanks for sharing this work. It was really yeah. really nice. Thanks a lot as well for listening. Okay. Come on. Okay. <clears throat> okay.